this meeting to order. Uh, I've ensured a quorum. There are five present in the room. Sarah's online. Um, I want to thank everybody. Deja vu. Thank you for coming again. Um, also, a thank you to the public for pointing out um, that that the uh, agenda wasn't posted online. And a thank you to Katya for just pausing things. Um, it's really important that we, of course, follow state law, um, the open meeting law. Okay, um, the meet, meeting purpose remains the same, financial planning, budgeting, board training, also reports um, from committees and, and outside organizations. Um, we will start with public comment. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read the preamble. Uh, the board welcomes comments, but is not able to take any action on them other than to direct the public to the appropriate staff member or to the complaint procedure. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Time may not be ceded to another speaker. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board, on the staff, or in the public. Please raise your hand and wait to speak until you are asked to. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared. You can certainly express your agreement with those comments, but keep it short if you would. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone. Shouting and profanity are prohibited. As the board chair, I will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting. I also do want to make sure that everyone does sign in so we have public record of who's present. Um, and with that, do I have someone who Chelsea usually keeps time, but she can't be there. Can you keep? Okay, great. So with that, I'll open for and throwing <laughs> and uh, public comment. Yes, Emma. Hi, um, thanks for having me again. My name is Emma Janicki. I'm the fourth through sixth grade science and social studies teacher at Braintree and I reside in Montpelier. Um, I said this at the meeting that was canceled, but I wanted to reiterate, I was really surprised to receive the community survey about uh, finding money for a school resource officer position. Um, when we at Braintree don't have a full-time nurse, a full-time social worker, a full-time guidance counselor. Um, we don't have dedicated behavior interventions full-time at our school. We're relying on one special educator and our admin administrative assistant to essentially do the jobs of about seven people. So I just wanted to say again that it was surprising that there might possibly be money for this police officer role when there are mental health roles and uh, school nurse roles that are not currently being um, funded full time at our school. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. In the room, online. <coughs> going once, going twice. Okay, thank you. The wrong one. Uh, we need to vote, everybody, on the motions um, that were made and uh, voted on in uh, last Wednesday's attempted meeting. Um, so, do I have? This is regarding the employees' retirement. The, benefits? Yes, regarding what is actually next on the agenda. But if, unless people feel the need to discuss it further we can vote to affirm the vote we made last week. We have still have that motion written down somewhere? Yes. So, so moved. Yes. Second. Moved by Katya, seconded by Sam. Further discussion? Could I just have a rereading of the motion? Sure. Kyle, do you have the motion language with you? To just from the last. Do you, was it a we charged the, Lane yeah. with the motion was yes. um, charging Lane to look into the employee yes. retirement. Request the board to charge. Lane requested the board to charge him with getting more information on the on the um, retirement on, on what it would take and any other employees that might be impacted. Right, and any other employees and the financial implications of of back. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So uh, moved by Katya, seconded by Sam. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? If it, you were in favor, yes, Sarah? Yes. Okay, great, but then it passes unanimously, thank you. Um, so we can skip the next. Uh, Ms. Skolnick, Nora, if you'd like to uh, start what I understand is gonna be kind of a, a comment from you, but also open for questions from the board. Exactly, yes. Great. So um, we wanted to follow up on, on things that we, issues that we had raised in the previous meeting. Um, so I'm not sure if I, if I want to present a letter to the whole board and that I'm going to read it, but to have a copy and that's been signed by um, all the faculty at RES and support staff. And I have copies for other members as well. Or here, you can take and pass them around if you want. <laughs> so, to the members of the Orange Southwest School District Board, um, we, the undersigned faculty and staff of Randolph Elementary School, have been working under some very challenging conditions. It is clear that we are in need of greater resources than we currently enjoy if we are to properly provide all care and services to all of our students. There has been some progress made in improving conditions. Staff has been meeting weekly to create and improve systems and to prevent and or deal with disruptive behaviors. Our building administrators have been working with staff to help with the decision process regarding if and when restraint is necessary. We also are going to have two half days of in-service training on de-escalation techniques in January. There are, however, some serious items that have not yet been addressed, and we come now before you to seek the following. One, an action plan created and agreed upon jointly by the SEL, the Social and Emotional Learning Team, staff and administrators for effectively engaging with challenging student behaviors. The, what has been put out, I want to clarify, as an action plan has not been agreed upon or discussed or had any input from the RES staff. Two, in-person training for all staff in an agreed upon program such as CPI or handle with care so that if the restraint is needed, staff will be able to perform it in a safe and respectful manner. Training should include time for practice and clarification and should be paid time. And I want to clarify on that one as well. Um, there has been CPI training offered, um, but there has been no time for, it's been a video that's been shown with time for some questions, but there has been no hands-on practice for the techniques. Number three, planning for and development of an in-district alternative classroom <coughs> options for students with demonstrated need. Four, reinstating the RISE program in its original form. This program has done amazing work and that work is now being under, undermined. If the district wishes to expand the RISE program to other schools in, in the district, then additional staff needs to be hired rather than taking staff from the existing program. And I'm gonna circle back to clarify that a little bit more in a moment. And five, we ask additionally that communication between district administration and the schools be improved. While we have full trust and confidence in our principal, Melinda Robinson, the same cannot be said in regards to other members of the district administration. Melinda listens to staff and does her best to provide remedies for problems disclosed to her in the interest of providing the best for students. She respects our intelligence, our education, experience, opinions, and professionalism. She trusts our intent to do our best based on our knowledge of and experience with the children we teach and guide each day. Unfortunately, decisions made and behaviors exhibited at the district level have shown that we are not held in that same regard. Staff morale is extremely low, and there are many who are not certain whether they can continue now or return next year if conditions don't, do not improve significantly. What we're asking here will, we believe, help ease some of the burdens by providing 
to us more of what we need to best support the children in our care. Thank you for our attention. So I do want to circle back to a little more explanation on the RISE program and um, want to turn things over to Natalie Sugarman, who is one of the co-teachers in the RISE. I am so happy something for you all to look at. I'll just give that to you as well. So the packet that uh, is being handed out includes the RISE program description, which outlines what we do in RISE, and some surveys that we completed last year and the year before. Um, so Deb and I were hired to create the RISE program from scratch, and we did it. RISE is doing exactly what the district had hoped it would do. We're helping students with some of the most challenging behaviors to be successful. We are teaching students with trauma to understand why they are responding in unsuccessful ways and how to re regulate their emotions and behaviors. This enables them to be successful as students and children. We have done this in a way that has allowed students to remain in their classroom and be a part of their school community. We did not need a school within a school to do it. We have successfully supported numerous students who would have otherwise then considered for referral to an alternative school, but the program we built allowed these students the opportunity to stay in their home school and learn the skills they needed to be successful. With the continued support of RISE, these students are still doing really well. Will there be a small fraction of students who need more? Yes, of course. It is impossible to believe that we are going to help every single child. There are some students who will need greater level of care, but that is only a very small fraction of students. In terms of the expansion of RISE, um, the superintendent's report says that RISE is now expanded into Braintree, but that's not really correct, because right now, one staff member from RISE has been pulled away from her duties and her caseload of students to support Braintree and offer them support as they try and fill the open counseling position that they were unable to fill earlier this year. Pulling someone out of their daily caseload and moving them over to another school without notice does not allow for any thoughtful planning or potential for success. We are more than happy to help Braintree, but this is not the way to do it. It takes away from the much needed services at RES. I don't mean to be blunt or disrespectful, but it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. We are happy that the district wants to develop services at Braintree and Brookfield. Deb and I have offered to help to consult and share curriculum in growing similar services in those two schools. In order to expand the services, there needs to be thoughtful planning. It's important to figure out the unique needs of those two schools. Deb and I welcome the opportunity to share our thoughts and our ideas, but let's please do it the right way. And my final note, and Deb Patone, who is on Zoom right now and is not feeling well and unable to join, um, put together a play poster boards. We, so um, in, when we started in 2019, um, there's the report that goes out from the superintendent. And um, Mr. Millington had written in here that, you know, a program, brand new program like Rise and the preschool that the schools were developing, it would take three to four years for uh, us to start seeing benefits of these programs. And so we are in our fifth year, and in our third year and our fourth year, we conducted surveys to parents, um, students, teachers, and Deb was able to capture some of the results of that and put it down for you to just read. Um, but it was very favorable. There's a lot of positive feedback on teachers, parents, and students' part on how successful the program has been for them and for the families. And so I just wanted to talk about that and the importance of RISE and what it has done with the district, or for at least our yes. And I think a further clarification to, just to explain is that this year, I think in part due to the, the crisis that we, we've been under in terms of the challenging behaviors, um, rather than RISE working in how it has been for the last couple of years, it, it sort of has become a dumping ground where children um, 
are dysregulated and they're, they're put into that room for a little while or those or Natalie and Deborah being called to help with those on top of Mike and Haley um, intervening. And because it, there's just not, it's too much for two people. Um, and they're, therefore, they're also not able to do the original program. And that's an awesome part of what we mean by that it needs to get back to that form that they, the program that they had to do. So this is open for the board to ask questions. I, I guess I have a, a, just a clarifying one that the, that the request to the board um, because as you know, um, we work from a kind of a, a policy level and budgeting, right? So what I hear from both of you on one hand, and this is just a small part of it, is this funding piece though, um, and, and, and more staff. So that's something that we may or may not be able to have an effect on. But um, in terms of, um, I don't want to misquote, um, an action plan being created, that's not necessarily a, a directive that would come from us uh, because it's operational. People can interrupt me anytime to direct or, okay. Uh, yes? I have a variety of comments. The first one, I guess, is that I think we might be in a gray area in terms of meeting loss um, because there was no specific topic for this discussion item. Um, and so it would have been nice to have been able to come in having an understanding of what people were going to discuss so that I could have an intelligent kind of informed conversation uh, kind of back with folks. So I, I, I guess that's kind of my first concern. Um, there are a lot of parts and pieces in here that I think are important to, to kind of talk a little bit about, so I'm glad the folks brought it up. The first is the action plan. A generic action plan was created um, with the paraprofessionals as well as a local psychologist in town um, that I spent a little bit of time with talking about the issues that are happening at um, RES um, as well as with a behavioral uh, panelist. Um, it was left open-ended so that folks at RES could actually start to fill in the blanks of the six or seven kind of goals that were a part of that action plan. And my understanding is that RES has been working very closely with Melinda, who is under the direction of central office to actually do that work. And it sounds like that work has been progressing quite well. So there is an action plan in, in place. Um, the teams that are working on it have input into the components of the action plan. Um, and Melinda has been doing a wonderful job as far as I can tell, you know, guiding that process, taking in people's inputs and modifying it as needed based upon what people are saying. Um, in terms of classroom options, that one is probably a part of the action planning work that we're doing, so I can't talk intelligently about that. But the RISE program, I think we need to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, five or six years ago, uh, and Erica McLaughlin this year, we spent a tremendous amount of time kind of talking about um, trauma-based behaviors and trying to create a program that might address those. But that program was sold to the community at a cost of about $300,000 with the intent that it would serve all elementary students across the district. And there was a very specific written plan and intent behind that program that was sold to the community, which is how we got the budget to pass. That program has never, with the exception of the last week when thankfully folks were willing to go out to Braintree and help out with some of the problems that they're experiencing in terms of challenging behavior with kids, has never been realized. It has primarily been focused almost entirely at RES. And it's been a bone of contention for five years about the expansion of the program. Um, I personally could support having more people um, there to be able to kind of expand the program, but the idea that it was intended for RES and is only for RES was never a part of the plan. It was not what was sold to the community as part of the budgeting process uh, five years ago. Um, and so I think it's a worthy discussion to have. Um, and those are my basic comments. You know, like I said, unprepared as I am because I didn't know what the topics were to me. Rachel, did you have a comment or a question? No, I was just kind of thinking that, yeah, why should 
why should students at different elementary schools have different resources available to them for trying to develop? I see your hand up. I just want to give the, the board the <coughs> chance again if there are comments, clarifications that you need, uh, if you have your own concerns about yes, this as it was written on the agenda. I had one question, which is, what is the budget for Rise? And Wayne, you just touched on that three hundred thousand. Yes, give or take a little, so three hundred thousand annually. Okay. What would be the budget impact of expanding it to all of the schools? I think the, in the form, team in the, form, in the form that it's in in Randolph. It sounds like all the resources of that 300,000 have been put into Randolph and Brookfield and Braintree have, have been left out of that. Yeah, so that I've, resource allocation. I think there's so. a good thing that's going on now uh, with one of the members of the RISE program over at Braintree because they can be able to help and provide an analysis of what might be helpful in terms of expanding the program. I think that somebody should probably spend a little bit of time up at Brookfield as well from the team to see. And yet, what we're hearing from are. them that that's. That that's not ideal and, and quite stressful. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to respond or not. Well, so I, this I, is a dialogue, I, ask, right? I think it's part of the funding. How many how many staff members are allocated to that program? Three. Two. Three. Three. So there's a, there should be a paraprofessional as well. No, no. Unless, two. Where did the para, do we know where the paraprofessional there is? No, is? There has never been a paraprofessional that has been specifically for the RISE program. So, the, well, right. again, so the. Right. It's just come down and What's that? It's just been Dr. Tone and myself. So, so I'll have to go back and see what happened at RES, what happened with the para, but there was, meant, there was always supposed to be three, and I can provide folks with the original intent. Um, the paraprofessional was there. We had even talked about having an academic teacher as well um, at one time trying to expand the program. Um, the purpose for the paraprofessional was is if you have students that are <sighs> having behaviors that are so challenging they can't access the curriculum anyway, um, then it makes sense to really try to hone in, if possible, on the focus uh, on the needs of the child, right? To try to deal with the problems that are getting in the way of learning and try to focus on them intently. The goal of the paraprofessional in the program was to be able to, as the child acquired skills and the behavior challenges, um, lowered a little bit was to be able to get them back into the regular education setting as much as possible you know get them down there you know sit with them while they practice their new skills and then bring them back to the rise program to debrief if things started to fall apart so again we were far afield of the, the original intent of the I, I have a question um so just to clarify so we have three hundred thousand budget annually for this program but obviously if there's it sounds like that, that funding is not being used to the maximum of what's available for this line item? Is that an understanding that maybe? We're going to find out. I'm going to find out what happened to the paraprofessional. Okay. Okay. I have a couple of responses and maybe clarifications as well. So this is from the 2019 um, report that was put out. And it talks specifically about the RISE program, um, an elementary therapeutic program. And it says, because the cost of the because of the cost of the program, we are only seeking to create it at Randolph Elementary. RES was chosen because of its central location, but it would include qualifying Brookfield and Braintree students as long as their parents approve of their attending RES. So the original intent was that if students in the other elementary schools needed this program, they would then come to RES. The, the problem that we're having now is because the way the program was designed was for two, the two staff members who are running it to be, then they have a group of, a core group of students that they work with. And those are students who have um, been through a, a process to be approved to be part of the RISE program. When we take Natalie and we have her go to spend two hours a day I'm not sure if I'm speaking the correct amount, so I'll let her clarify on the A day in Braintree, while it's now serving students in Braintree, the students that are part of that core program in, in Randolph are no longer getting her services. What they have offered numerous times is 
to have somebody be hired for Braintree or hired for Brookfield if that's how you want to expand the program and then to train them um, and to work with them to creating the program in that setting or to go back to the original intent and have those students who need to be part of that program come to Randolph to attend school in Randolph so that they can. But by spreading, having her go to those times to Braintree, she's no longer able to serve the students that she's supposed to be serving in Randolph, and it's causing great, tremendous difficulty for the students who are on the program. That makes sense. I. So it seems like there are kind of two parallel conversations going on here. One is a kind of not disagreement, but what was the intent of it, and is it fulfilling that intent? And seeing the the success and the uh, the survey results, if that is indeed what's going on, how might it be expanded? Because there is more need. Correct, and and, mm -hmm. and I want to be clear that we're not saying that Braintree and Brookshill shouldn't have it, or that there aren't serious difficulties with student yeah. behaviors in those schools, and but. I think as Natalie said, you can't take from one and spread it thinner to serve all. It needs to be expanded in a different way so that the needs aren't getting pulled from in one place. Are there any students from Brookfield and Braintree being transported and attending school at RES for no. this purpose? No, and that's been the problem. The original intent was that at the beginning of every year, the teens, the elementary principals, were supposed to get together, look at all the kids that might qualify for participation in the RISE program, and they were supposed to prioritize them. And then those kids from Braintree and, and Brookfield um, were intended, if the parents were willing, to have them come to uh, Randolph Elementary. There was intense um, pushback in terms of having the children go to RES. Um, all across the five years. At this point in time, you know, we're at a crisis point um, where Braintree is also experiencing a lot of challenging behaviors that are happening at RES and across the state where they needed help, they needed services, and for five years, um, both Braintree and Brookfield have been predominantly excluded from the services of the rest program. So it made sense to at least until, and that was a temporary thing, it was started up about a week, week and a half ago, and it was to go through the holiday season, which is next week, to get a second set of eyes in there to take a look so that when the teams came together to actually talk about the students and kind of what you're seeing and you know what might help in terms of accommodations, we've got some other eyes on it so that that conversation can be much much more deep and fruitful um, was the intent. So, so it wasn't I'm a permanent hearing, thing. What I'm hearing in the room is actually a lot of people who are on the same in the same lane right and and maybe coming at it from a more administrative maybe coming at it from a more funding maybe but i i just feel the need to acknowledge that there's a lot of agreement in the room um so and i think it's important to emphasize that because we all want to look forward right we we don't the past can inform us um but we want to spend more time looking that way Yes. Um, sorry, I think it's relevant. Uh, Richard Howard, I'm a 5-6 teacher here at Brookfield. I think it's worth noting that over the past couple of years as well, um, not only do we not have the RISE program here at Brookfield, but we've also had students, at least two that I can think of, who have come up who should have been Randolph, uh, but Randolph did not have the room to accommodate them, and they were brought to Brookfield, who absolutely qualified for the RISE program and didn't have access to that service. So not only do we not have access to the program ourselves, we're taking the overspill from Randolph. Excuse me. May I have your name, please, sir? Uh, yeah, Richard Hayward. <coughs> I'm sorry. Richard Hayward. Thanks. Very good. The Thanks. only other comment to make is I, I like the idea of the, the survey data that, that people are collecting, but one of the pieces that was put in when the RISE program started that I still do not have and have been asking for five years is objective data on which students are being served, what the impact of the program has been on the students. Um, we did something similar with special education four or five years ago where the teachers created a wonderful rubric based upon the amount of service time that the students were receiving to be able to tell the impact of the services, right? If the services are good over time, 
the number of hours or minutes of services that students need should shrink. We have no objective data, or at least I have no objective data um, from the RISE program to show what's been produced. And who would that come from to you? Would that, that come I have been from? asking for that from the principals who okay. should have been working with the, the RISE program staff to develop that. It sounded like there was a start on that in the first year and that there were some good ideas, um, but I don't think it was ever capitalized on. So I think it's a valuable program, but it would be nice to have that data to be able to go out and sell it to the community that, hey, we've got an opportunity here to expand something that looks like it's working well. Here's the data to back up why we're asking for these funds. Melinda? Hi, I'm Melinda Robinson, the principal at Randolph. Um, we have had um, the opportunity to qualify what um, levels of service our RISE program has had, and I have, I believe, given that to you, Lane. Um, I would always like to also address the idea of students coming from other schools to RES. We have had times where we've pushed back on that, and I think one of the reasons that we've done that is because um, they do need it at Braintree and Brookfield as well. It's too, it's hard to have everything all at RES because it overwhelms the general ed classrooms with a lot of extra needs at, at one school in certain grades where it becomes overwhelming. So it's, I, I would love to try to figure out how we could support getting the RISE program across the Brookfield and Braintree and RES schools so that it's equitable across them. And we've been trying to work towards that. Thank you. Board members. I'm thinking about the budget information that we received over the last couple of months and the concern that we're going to be in that um, with the change in funding that we're going to be in that area where we'll have a huge rise potentially or a, a penalty for being over budget in places and so if there's a there's a finite amount of money and we have this is the pot like and we decide we want to prioritize expanding the rise program we have to take from somewhere else that's what's on my mind and you've got your budget presentation coming up in a little while, but hopefully if it's not too confusing with how the legislation is that it'll make things a little clearer on what the circumstances look like for the next five years. So what I'd like to suggest in order to, to keep things moving along and sticking to the agenda and trying to be more timely, um, this is clearly not a place we're gonna come to solutions, but it's an excellent exchange of information. Um, with lots of different voices, which I, I really appreciate. Um, it, it's a lot of it is not new information, but we're clarifying information for the board. So more questions may come up from us. And because it is part of our duty to immediately go to numbers, um, the more information we have in this <coughs> later presentation and also how we can work together to present to the community the needs and where we're taking from um, the the further we can take this conversation so I'm gonna put a, a pause and make one no but only because I'm trying to get so much better at this that I'm really putting I'm hitting the pause so I'm saying this agenda item is done um, and we're and we're going to move on and I'm really trying to okay thank you everyone um, for I have a clarifying words. question. About what I've just said? Yes. Okay. Is, is it, as, as a member, or, or can we submit things to the board that we weren't able to follow up on in writing um, since we weren't able to, to have it as part of the conversation? You can always submit information to the board. It doesn't mean that you will receive either an answer or a, a, even a comment like because we have the, to speak as one. procedure mm -hmm. so that we're doing things properly. Every single person in this room, every single person online, and the people who are not present for this meeting always have access to board members. The tricky thing with sharing information when we're not in a public meeting is that we cannot engage in a back and forth. A sharing of information and an acknowledgement of receipt can happen. That's where it ends until we are in another public meeting. 
understood. And yeah. Okay. I asked one final question. Sorry. Trying so Can, hard. Do I, when we do this, do I address it? Do we address it to you as the chair, or do we send it to the entire board? If you send it to me, the board, so the board, the because board. then if I forward, then it gets yeah. tricky. So with right. electronic, send it to each of us. Thank you. Procedure mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone, again. Uh, oh, God. Heather, um, wow, you're ready. Your uh, presentation of options for a superintendent search. Um, thank you, members of the board and community. Um, I will try to keep this brief and maybe save you a few minutes. Um, I'd like to present to the board and the community um, some options for the superintendent uh, search. Um, the district received uh, the resignation of the current superintendent on December 8th, um, and that resignation is effective June 30th. So time is truly of the essence. Um, the board is the hiring entity in this, uh, for this position. Um, currently, there are five neighboring districts that are engaged in superintendent searches. Um, Addison Central announced their opening of applications in August uh, with the help of McPherson Jacobson search firm, and they announced their selected candidate on November 28th. Dr. Wendy Baker will be starting with them uh, July 1st. Two Rivers Supervisory Union decided to run their own search without a search firm. They posted it in November, and uh, the applications closed December 14th, um, and they're currently reviewing their applications. Both Caledonia Central and Grand Isle hired the Vermont School Board Association as their uh, search firm. Um, both of them are posted until filled. Caledonia posted October 30th, and Grand Isle posted December 11th. Um, and lastly, Hartford. Hartford is opening their search soon. They have hired Cooperative Education Services, and they're hiring for 2025. So they are giving themselves a year and a half for this search. Um, so I'm compelling the board uh, to consider this an urgent measure to make a decision on how to move forward. Um, you have a few choices. You can hire an executive search firm to manage your search, as uh, many districts do. This is the slowest process because you need to open an RFP, a uh, request for proposals, to receive your options uh, before you select a firm, which will add a month to your search. You can conduct an internal search run by the board, um, open to the public. I recommend a subcommittee, an advisory hiring committee, and I'll go into that more deeply. Or you can post the position internally and promote from within. So each of these have a cost and a timeline. The most expensive and the longest is with a search firm because just to open it for requests for proposals and to receive those and choose your vendor is a month. Um, the lowest cost option there is going to be your Vermont School Board Association. They only charge about $15,000 for the search, but some of the executive search firms charge $40,000 to $100,000. So um, the Vermont School Board Association only accepts three per year, and I think they, I don't know if they have capacity for another one, but I would reach out to them to inquire um, because they do good work and they are not terribly expensive. Um, conducting your own board search would be um, much faster because you could, would cut out the RFP process. Um, and your cost would be limited to your own expenses and possible stipends for committee members, and it would probably be under 10,000. Um, and your third option is to post internally. I do recommend whatever option you choose, you highly consider creating an advisory hiring committee beyond the board. And that would be, um, you would choose a cohort of people to advise you. And I would recommend that you include students, support staff, teachers, administrators, other citizens, including senior citizens, business owners, and any community stakeholders you think should have a voice in this choice. And then, um, so I compel you to action. I think time is of the essence to get the best candidates. I think this district deserves the best candidates. So if you'd like to retain a search firm, um, I compel you to not delay in funding that expense, 
and opening the RFP. If you decide to conduct your own search, um, whether it's open or from within, uh, the creation of a subcommittee, if you so choose, would be uh, a possible next step. And that's it. I'm out at five minutes. <laughs> open for questions and comments. Uh, so let's let's discuss. It is. I agree. Thank you, Heather. My um, question. Uh, something for us to start talking about right now. Well, I'm speaking right now, Hannah Arias. That was Heather Lawler, Assistant Superintendent, who was giving that presentation. That was a question from online. Um, we thoughts? Do you think you should? We should hire a partner. Yes. <laughs> I see lots of nods. Is our Two nods. And do you have a different thought, Sarah, as well? Well, I'm just thinking if we want to expand our RISE program, and the that that's a lot more expensive. And I would suggest that we try VSBA before we jump to a higher that's hiring firm. That's, right. That's hiring VSBA. Okay. That's, 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 what, that's what I would. I would lean that, that, that direction. And if and if rather than a uh, expensive executive search firm. I'm just not, not sure that's the best. Yeah, hiring it outside, not having the force of subcommittee. I think we still need a subcommittee for our yes, advisory hiring. Yes, we would yeah, still. Yeah, advisory hiring committee yeah. regardless. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it would that just talk, thinking about that topic, would it be kind of a call for interested folk? Would it be how would we form it? Uh, and uh, full transparency, I've already been approached by a few people who would be interested in in being a part of such a committee if one existed. So, um, how would we do it? Do we, do we have a consensus on the one of the, of the three options here? Or are we? Well, I think we're kind of like shifting, shifting. Uh, well, that but we're kind of shifting. Here. We started with what are we going to do? Yes. Now we're to the. Well, and one of them, yes, is a given, right? Because you just said the advisory committee is a given. So right, let's, right. Let's. Thank you. But but figuring out how we put a, an advisory committee together is another. It's another, another topic, another thing to discuss. Yes. If you if you hire a firm, they will help you with the creation of the. Oh, there you go. There it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then I propose that we vote to charge someone uh, to um, contact the SBA and perhaps a couple of other places to get. Yeah, I think we should go ahead and open a request for proposals, and because if the VSBA is already maxed for this year, right. if they've already done, because this was just neighboring districts, this is not state statewide that you're looking at, and they've got three per year, and they cover the state. So if, if they're like, we can't help you this year, we still need to move right and quickly hire because someone else. All of those districts are months ahead of us, ahead of us. Right. looking at the same pool of people. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I'll make a motion to have the board chair look into uh, hiring, uh, examining outside firm, including the SBA. Open the request for proposal. Open and, and open the request for proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Do I have a second? I'll second that. <laughs> Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Awesome. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. I will do that. Not a problem. Not happy. Happy to do it. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. Um, review annual report to voters. So uh, Chelsea had sent out a letter for us to read and respond to. Um, do people have, uh, I won't start with concerns, do people have 
uh, enthusiastic responses, concerns about the letter, a full rewrite? Do they have yeah. suggestions of edits? And where the letter is this? This is in the town report. The correct? town report. Yes. Personally, I really liked it. Um, you know, our biggest, I think one of the biggest things this year has been connection, mm -hmm. um, ownership linkage, and what that means, and, and how we're trying to strengthen it. Um, gosh, it's in our packet, isn't it? Yeah, it, it was, was separate. No, it was separate. It was yeah. separately. Yeah. All right. Oh, no. She, didn't she hand it out at the end of last meeting? She did. Yeah, that's it, right mm -hmm. there. Yep. Oh, there it is. Yes. And you've got it. Okay. Um, so is there anyone with concerns, A, with anything in the letter, and B, with the uh, deciding to, tonight, if this is, if this speaks for us? When do we have to submit this? January, right? Mid January? Or no, it's about doing it the week before the March vote. So February 6th, I think, was Ben's absolute drop dead. That's when it still gets printed, though, into the town report? Yeah, it's earlier is better if you can. That's the OSSD for the annual report. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I don't want to vote on it tonight. Right. Okay. So yeah, but I don't know. It, well, it sounds like, um, although we've all had a chance to read it and we, well, speak for myself, like the direction it's going, there are some uh, specific things that we want to either edit, take out, add. Um, so I'd like to suggest that Chelsea's not here tonight and, you know, partially because she's just has some stuff going on, so um, table this till next month's meeting. Well, final. what Ben had said in the meeting, because I was working with Chelsea on this, mm -hmm. is you know, if people I believe we sent out or Chelsea was sending out a, a, an electronic copy, mm -hmm. so if um, can we make edits on that? Yeah, okay, yeah, um, and then and then it's it's ours to do with. You know, and edit it to where we want it to be. So if okay. folks have, can we turn over, uh, turn this over to email correspondence with the expectation that we'll vote next meeting? Um, what I would feel more comfortable with is if people want to send edits to Anne as the other member of that um, committee, and she put them in, and that can be presented at the next meeting. Just because, again, we don't want to get into a back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, or working on like something a collaboratively. Yeah. Like an email discussion. Yeah. Right. So email edits to Anne and then I'll mm -hmm. next meeting. What I might do, um, what if I, uh, do you guys know how to use the suggestions in the, the track change? Mm -hmm. In the track change for the Google Docs. So I'll make it into a Google Doc and then you can just edit the Google Doc. Perfect. And is the board okay with Chelsea and I making the final? decision about we're going to accept these. <laughs> no, I think we still need to present. We're going to read the final. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But do you want us to, signature. but do you want us to put through all those suggestions as yeah, they come in? Yeah, it's appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where we think it's appropriate. Yeah. And then we okay. all get another Then chance. you get then a look, we get another chance okay. to look at it. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure. Before we fix our signatures. Thank you. Anne. Okay. So that's just a, an action item. There's no vote there. Great. Um, review board member terms. So uh, three. There are three terms coming to an end in March. Um, one from Braintree, one from Brookfield, one from Randall. Um, it's my understanding that. The, is this this is the kind of conversation we have to have, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. my understanding that um, there will be an open seat in Randolph and an open seat <clears throat> in Brookfield. Mm -hmm. 
So those that are here, uh, um, yeah, let people know. Um, and and uh, have them come to, if you find someone that's interested. Have them come to a meeting, see how we how we operate, and um, great. Board members too. Spread spread the word. Uh, I think mm -hmm. so. Megan is not. Well, I think we need to clarify if there are open seats at all. Yes. Oh right, yeah. there are two that do not intend to. Sorry, there are two, two that do not intend to run. Re, 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 yeah. So Megan is not running. Is that correct? Right? Okay, so Megan's not going to run, and Chelsea's not going to run. And who's the other open? Who's Rachel? Rachel. Uh, Rachel and Braintree. And Braintree. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. There are three open seats. I don't know if I'll get enough signatures. <laughs> Okay. Was that okay? Okay. I'll that's turn that um, Okay. Next up, the complaint procedure. Katya, you had requested that this um, that we review one more time. Yeah. If you want to take over. Yeah. Well, I, well I'm here. no. I just um, I just think that the board should evaluate step one personally. Um, I think that. I don't know how to make this a, um, I don't know, it just, it just feels that sometimes having somebody have to go to that individual that they have a complaint against can be a challenge. Um, and I wouldn't want to dissuade people from bringing complaints forward for the discomfort of having to first, the first step being to confront that individual that they have the complaint against. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm saying. It does make sense what you're saying. So I'm not, I'm just saying I, I just feel it's worthwhile just evaluating if that is how we feel the order should be. Or if we don't, what does that look like? Oh, it's in the packet. Yeah. Did we not have it in our thing? I guess we don't. Yes. I I have that same issue with the procedure and I understand the purpose of initially that being in. Um, I think the purpose was to try to get things resolved uh, at a lower level um, and, and so that way the board isn't bringing hearings more frequently than necessary, um, but I do share that same concern with the discomfort of having to, the complaint and having to face the person they're complaining about. Um, so what would you suggest instead? Maybe we can, right, or maybe we can think of maybe some examples. So how, you know, if it's a teacher, might have a complaint with an administrator, do they hop over that administrator and go to the superintendent? So if it's a problem with a teacher, a parent has a problem with a teacher. Right, do they go to the principal? Can there be a central? Can there be a central complaint receiver within the district who then facilitates facilitates a discussion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be like a mediator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gosh, don't be involved in training and mediation. Something similar. Mm -hmm. Um, the I CBA, the, yeah. the CBA probably has There's some a, rules about how things have to be done. Two or three things just to, to be aware of as you approach this. 
uh, fall on all of them right now. So the CBA requires uh, an informal step before like a grievance process, which means that people are supposed to sit down and talk it out. Um, one of the reasons I think to do that is so there's no automatic presumption of guilt on the part of the other party. Um, the other piece, let me see if I can find this, give me just a second. This time was moving them around a little bit. B27, um, you might have to change other policies if you go about this. <coughs> B27 has two pretty specific um, pieces to it that would probably also have to be looked at. It is the policy of the Orange Southwest School District to see the complaints about school personnel are considered in a timely manner that is fair to all parties. The district places trust in its employees and desires to support their actions in such a manner that employees are freed from unnecessary, spiteful, or unjustified criticism or complaints, which is probably why that first step is, is there. There is another piece here, um, the individual employee involved, so this is the person who the complaint is against, shall be given every opportunity for explanation, comment, and presentation of the facts as he or she, she sees them. So those components either would need to be preserved in whatever you're thinking about, or you would have to change the statement of the B27 as well. I think step one could stand as long as you put in language for when there's a disparity of power. power. Have so, a facilitator. Right. So that if there's a student who wants to complain about a teacher, they, there's a disparity of power there. Mm -hmm. So you need language for like how they might get an advocate or facilitator. We've got really good counselors that have served that role in the past. Or even a perception of an imbalance of power. Mm -hmm. You know, just that they have access to an advocate and who the guidance to who that advocate should be. Be it union representation or mm -hmm. something like that. I think in any, in any conflict, there's going to be a, a perception of sure. just very powerful. That's a very insightful. Yeah. I like the idea of a, a training facilitator. Maybe that's part of an HR revamp for the district is, right? You know, we talked about the importance of having an HR person. That's one of the things that we can do. I think just making that, making that available to anyone who needs to go through step one? Anyone, anyone who needs to go through step one may have may access a facilitator. Employee assistant program provides them. Oh. It takes a little bit of time, but they one of the things that they do is they do provide a facilitator. But then what about what about for the more students or parents, parents or community parents. members or parents or mm -hmm. students who don't have the EAP? Yeah, there's a lot of different scenarios. Lots of different relationships. Yeah. Be managed. Yeah. And then it may even present, I mean, if it's someone from outside the district, um, there may be a perception of, of um, bias going to a facilitator that's employed by the district. Mm. I don't think we can fix all the problems. So. <laughs> I, I hear you. No, I don't think we can fix all the problems, but if we're going to offer up something and call it an unbiased resource, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that when you're employed, mm -hmm. there's a disparity of power. Mm -hmm. there is, there's a perception of it. Uh, there is the restorative justice program out of mm -hmm. South Royalton. You could probably provide facilitators from outside for both students and as a brainstorming as you're talking. Yeah, the AOE actually, um, yeah, recommended that. As you're thinking about policy. And in fact, if the board wants me to, I can talk to this person who recommended it said talking to Scott would actually be, because um, he's very connected with them. Assistance with step one. Yes. You can access an advocate. 
as an advocate for your liberty schools. Since it's such a huge part of how we operate, yeah. I suggest we keep putting it on the agenda until we come up with language that um, people are comfortable with. Um, you know, it might be interesting to know how accessible the Center for Restorative Justice is, in that, can you make a phone call and say, hey, would there be someone willing to come and facilitate how? Um, how quickly that can happen, because let's not forget that a complaint might be very, you know, creative, a tricky working environment or learning environment or uh, parent relationship. Yeah? Okay. So, so do, can we have some, somebody, we should probably have somebody looking into what the options are or are we just gonna, is it, what I'm hearing is, seems like people like the idea of having, having access to someone that might be able to help you if you were concerned about going, making a complaint. So do we wanna have somebody look at what the different options are? Or I'll find out what they are? With a few suggestions. Coffee and like that be something you can pursue? Sure. What do I do? Suggestions. You can have suggestions of people who might be available or open. And that we would feel comfortable having in a board procedure. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Do we want to? Um, check with our legal counsel too just to make sure we're not putting ourselves in a in a yeah just to see what they like, might recommend or some suggestions yeah, yeah. on how this is done or this is how right. it's done at every or single maybe school another or, school does it another way or maybe they've already got a okay um is that that I might think, be do we that I contact or yeah, that sure. you contact? Yeah. <clears throat> I think if we yeah. say you can. Should yeah. we make a motion that Give says. Give authority to ask on behalf of the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking at your authority. I don't know. I'm not yet. I know. But I appreciate <laughs> confidence. All right. Our, I'll entertain a motion to. Uh, give Katya the authority to contact Pietro to offer guidance as to step one. Step one. Sounds like you made the motion. Options. I move. She can I? Yes, I you can. Yes, you oh, can. Oh, yeah. and I do yeah. move that. I'll second. Do I have a second? I'm second. And second. I will second. Oh, oh, and Sarah seconds. And Sarah seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. Opposed? Abstentions. Passes unanimously. So I think it's Do we have another vote right away? Uh, do we have another vote right away? We do not. We have committee updates. If committees have updates, yeah, we have a facilities monitoring report later, so I assume you don't have a separate update. Um, the Evaluation committee. It's Chelsea who yeah. chairs it. Um, and I was on that committee and ownership linkage. We don't have an update. And and I know we don't have she Rachel chairs, but I know we don't have an update. So committees have work to do in the next month. Uh, okay. Kara, please, um, Brookfield Elementary update from the principal. 
Do you want to sit up here and I'll swap with you? I don't mind. Oh, that's probably easier to get by the screen. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. This is really nice to be able to uh, let you all know what's going on in our school, so thanks. Um, I'm Kara Houston. I'm the principal of Berkeley Elementary School. I'm really excited to be here to tell you about our school. This is my first year at Brookfield as principal, and I'm really thankful to be a part of this school family. Um, one of the first things that struck me when I first started visiting the school last spring is that this is a community where everyone has a strong sense of responsibility and care for one another. So let me give you an example. Um, right now, sledding is a big hit, although that's not gonna be happening after today and yesterday, but uh, I've had older students who are helping younger kids get into sleds, they're showing them how and where to climb up the hill after they sled down. I have students asking others um, that they might not always play with to come and sled with them. Kids are respectfully reminding each other of the rules that we have for our sledding. Um, and they ask one another to join if somebody's feeling left out. Now, I, I don't just see this with the kids, I see it with the staff too. Um, a great example is uh, a teacher covering a, a lunch duty for somebody who needed time to process a situation with a student. Uh, or they consistently come together to use their collective genius to support our kiddos who need extra practice or help, whether it's in academics or uh, building their social skills. This group of individuals care for one another greatly. And this care is one of the things that makes our community shine. Uh, so here's a fraction of our caring individuals. We're a small school with about 80 students and 22 staff. Six of our staff members are shared between Brookfield and Braintree or Brookfield and Randolph. These are the individuals who work tirelessly to ensure that our students are getting what they need to grow into lifelong learners. So a great example of how we ensure students are getting what they need is through the use of data and collaboration. The three elementary schools have reinvested in professional learning communities where we come together and analyze recent data, create goals around that data, and adjust our teaching strategies accordingly. So we're collecting pertinent data regularly, whether it's from our benchmark assessments, which happen at the beginning, and middle, and end of the school year, our unit assessments, daily or weekly check-ins or exit tickets, these are all used to inform instruction decisions, instructional decisions within the classroom and create goal-driven interventions that will be regularly monitored by the classroom teachers and or the academic interventionists we have. We work closely with the other grade level teachers at Braintree and Randolph, as well as a whole school team. This consistent practice helps our teachers refine their teaching strategies and strengthen their instructional skills. It also helps me to determine the needs for professional development at a small scale during our building level PLC meetings and staff meetings, and to advocate for what we need at the district level. Now, academic mastery is crucial to our staff and students and we also value the work of our community members and families in our area. And we show this value through Farm to School. So this year, uh, Brookfield was awarded the Farm to School and Early Childhood Education Grant, and our school is building some strong connections between the classrooms, the community, and the cafeteria when it comes to food systems. Students are receiving monthly lessons from the Harvest of the Month curriculum, which are taught by our nurse, Mrs. Brooke Gray. This harvest food is then utilized by Miss Ann, who conducts a cooking class or cooking lesson and a taste test with classes. And we've also spent a lot of time creating a robust composting program initiated by our fourth grade class. And here they, you can see the picture of them presenting it to the whole school. Um, and that was done under Mrs. Ferris's direction. The students are learning about where local foods are coming from, farm systems, sustainability of farms and our land, and local economies. Farm to school learning doesn't only happen during the school day. 
Our after school program has also been extending these experiences. Like a few classes uh, picked apples at Liberty Orchards in the fall at a field trip, and the kids uh, in aftercare used some of those apples to make dehydrated apple stacks for later on in the week. The funds that we have received from this grant have been used to purchase a food cart for uh, easy classroom cooking experiments. We'll be using those funds to build more garden beds out here, um, the southern part of the building, possibly add some fruit trees to the property, We'll be marketing our harvests to the school and the community and possibly creating a farm stand. We'll see. So farm to school program has been one of the ways we are connecting with our community members. This year, our goal is to extend those connections because research shows they expand and enrich learning opportunities, foster civic responsibility, and encourage a sense of unity and pride for the place that we live. So here are the different ways that we're building those connection, connections. We're doing a lot. We're trying to increase participation in school club meetings and events. Uh, and our school club is the name of our PTO to make it more inclusive. Uh, we're working with the Brickfield Historical Society to promote learning of local history. We're working with local artists and farms to extend our learning experiences. For instance, Stephanie from Third Branch Pottery came up last week and did some pottery with our pre-K classes, our pre-K class, and um, what we're hoping to have a local sculptor for our artist in residency program in the springtime. We even have a volunteer coming in to support personal and small group learning projects weekly. So these are just some of the ways that we're building those connections with our community. This year, we really, really want to increase participation in our school club, and this is twofold. We want to grow the number of individuals attending our school club meetings and increase that participation in the events we plan. <coughs> Most events have occurred after school hours, causing scheduling conflicts for a lot of families. So in an effort to reach all students, the school club is trying to provide activities and events during the school day. And so we gave it a try this year with our Halloween stations. We had parent volunteers run five different stations, like making trick-or-treat bags, uh, playing Halloween games. It was a wonderful event, and the kids and the families that participated had a blast. We're also trying to provide a wide variety of events. For instance, two weeks ago, we held a family uh, movie night, and more than 80 people came. We have plans for an afternoon with a bonfire and sledding, um, and then a community variety show held in the evening for kids to show off their skills, whatever they may be, and have um, a silent auction during the intermission to raise funds for the school club so we can continue to put on these types of events. We're excited to continue our second year with STEM education at Brookfield. This provides students with the early exposure to STEM concepts, real world application, creativity, a preparation for a technological future. Our STEM classes work to build a range of skills from interpersonal to analytical to problem solving. And our STEM education also helps develop that curious mindset to foster that lifelong love of learning. Students work with our STEM teacher, Ms. Conti, weekly, in addition to their grade level science units, which are taught by their classroom teacher. Students have engaged in a variety of learning experience, um, experiences, such as our outdoor learning, robotics and coding, engineering experiments, and more. For two months, a group of students worked with linking engineering to life in our after school program. Uh, these students participated in weekly virtual challenges and are headed to Beta Technologies for a field trip to see electric airplane engineering in production. So they'll be going to that in January, which is a really uh, great event. So not only are we working on building uh, our students' skills in STEM, we're also building leadership skills. So at Brookfield, we are a school that implements the components of positive behavioral interventions and supports, PBIS. Through PBIS, we hope to build students' self-awareness and accountability for their behavior by providing opportunities for leadership both in the classrooms and in the school. Students are becoming more aware of their greater impact on the community. 
using these positive opportunities models what we expect well at Brookfield and gives students many ways to shine. So we do this in a few different ways. Expectations in the classroom and the school are modeled, taught, and frequently revisited throughout the school year. This sets the stage for the kids so they know what they should be doing and when, and it helps the flow of routine and creates more instruction time. We reinforce positive behavior with tokens and celebrations of hard work at our community circles with our shout outs, which are displayed in our bulletin board in the hallway, which you should check out. We celebrate as a whole school when we are in a massive container full of tokens. For example, last Friday, the students earned a crazy hair day uh, from our November collection of tokens. The last part is supporting our students when they, when they falter talking to them about their behavior, giving them options, practicing expectations with them. We have support from our social worker and board certified behavior analyst to support staff and students around more extreme behaviors. But to build on and extend those positive behaviors, we have been uh, implementing leadership roles. These roles uh, empower students by providing them responsibilities and opportunities to positively impact the school, build interpersonal skills, and continue to foster a sense of community within our school. So these are just a few of the many things we are doing here. And while this is just a glimpse of the school, uh, we would love for you to come and see it for yourself. And I'd be happy to show you all around at some time. Um, do you have any questions? That was a lot that I just gave you. I was just going to say I'm excited that you're doing farm to school. Um, you'll, you'll have to speak up. I'm excited sorry. that you're doing farm to school as the last a new elementary school in the district that hasn't had that program yet. So yeah. that's exciting that you yeah. were able to get that grant and bring that on board. Yes, it's been it's been really fun to reinvigorate the school and farm to school this year. It's been, um, and they've had they've had had it, but not to the extent that we have been building it this year. How big is your school club? I mean, how much participation do you have? So last year, there were only three members, including the former principal. Uh, this year, I, we've increased, it, increased the membership to the last meeting. I had three different individuals, which was great. Uh, but I think now we're at six new people who, who have um, communicated that they want to be involved and, and have been coming to meetings when they can. So we're, we're getting there. So okay. people can just show up and people can show up to our to our monthly meetings and like where should I talk to? <coughs> monthly meetings happening every Wednesday at seven right here in this room. Please come. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say monthly meetings every which Wednesday? The first Wednesday of every month. Yep. I missed the first part. I was like, and so it doesn't. I was confused. Like, <laughs> I was like, that's every Wednesday, but. Do you, when you have events at the school, yes, is parking a problem for families? Parking is a problem. Um, people make do though, because it's Vermont, right? You, <laughs> most people have their, their Subarus or four wheel drive vehicles, so they'll park on the side of the road. Um, and we also have the uh, outdoor school driveway, so people have been parking up along that driveway. There's a, if you go past, you can see a little dirt road, so people can go up there and park. Um, but it's, it is uh, challenging for those who need that accessibility. Yeah, because 80 is a lot. You said you had 80 people at Almost the Almost 80 students, yep. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I of course, yeah, yeah I'm happy to, happy to do it. Thank you for listening. And if uh, you need anything or have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very excited for that. Can I request that we move up our facilities monitoring as the next item? Absolutely. So I have a request that we move the facilities monitoring report up to the um, before reviewing EL reports, just to be mindful of schedules of people that have been before. So let's do we don't have to vote on that, do we? No. No. Okay. Great.
So, before we do the emergency facilities monitoring report, is that you? I guess so, Sam. Let's do it. Uh, Les and I submitted the engineering report, facilities report to you, the, the board for your review. And we're here in case you have any specific questions that we can ask. No, are there? No, it's there. Okay, I got a couple updates. The, uh, the generator for the RES, uh, we're in the middle of a waiver process on that. We only did successfully get two bids on that. So, um, Ms. Rob is uh, putting a waiver process in on that. We got the committees established. Ms. Uh, Melinda has the committees uh, for the playground equipment as well as the new bleachers um, <clears throat> and the reverse osmosis which is the last highlighted one is scheduled now confirmed for the uh 19 february break that's for your school Ms. Karen. when's when's the mascot going up in the field house that's uh <laughs> going up on the 29th at the high school can you remind me what happened to the bleachers at arias I think you told me. Yes. But I don't remember. Can you? They're old. <laughs> <laughs> they failed inspection? Yeah, they failed inspection. Okay. Uh, severe. We knew it was coming. We, we lived along. And we um, successfully secured that Lindbergh architect for the feasibility study? Ma'am, I did not hear you. I'm sorry. Did we su successfully secured um, Lindbergh architect for the feasibility study? Oh, yes, ma'am. That front hoop? I, I, I can't hear very well, but you didn't jump on another committee here earlier tonight, did you? Because you're going to be real busy starting Thursday. <laughs> I did not. Okay, good. <laughs> standing, <Okay>. standing attention. <laughs> Lindbergh's first, well, actually, second meeting is uh, uh, Thursday morning. Uh, can you give us an update on the Brookfield Well situation? Brookfield Well? Yeah. Um, I gave up on it. We put a lot of money in it. The well exists out there, and it, it is producing good, sweet water. But the um, the radon targets for schools is is so it's like a Burlington PCB problem. So I mean I I mean I'm creating I got good sweet water. I can supply water for the whole town, but we can't use it for a school. So that's why I'm putting in the uh, reverse osmosis. Gotcha. And I have a, I have an engineering review coming tomorrow morning at zero eight, so we're gonna be bouncing around here. Yeah. Yeah. They did they did a good job on that. There was an engineering report from I don't know how many years ago it was, but they had a series of steps that they recommended us take, right, from the least costly to the most. And so we went through all the steps and never the most costly. None of the other ones fixed the problem along the way, but we tried. So the water issue out of Brookfield there's kind of an automator between uh, Wes and I. We both don't have hair because we've been pulling our hair out because of the water. We've been working on it for five years. Take off the hat. <laughs> <laughs> so. the, um, the green space near the district office, that's started been morning. started, right? We saw it. Awesome. We made a lot of people angry in the community. Um, they get over it. I get over it. Mr. White, uh, David White, he, was, he realizes that uh, most of that stuff that he has back there is on our land. So he's been very, very accommodating. He realized that he's gonna get rid of it, but we're, we're cutting it down right now. Why is, it upset? Why is it upsetting to people? Pardon me, ma'am? Why is it upsetting to people? Because we should shut that road down. Oh, inconvenience. The inconvenience. They, they weren't as angry as they were about the uh, speed bumps, but they were pretty important <laughs> shut the road down. That's exciting. How are things going with the road that we redid by our TCC and the traffic situation there? He's been real quiet. It's good. been real quiet. Um, you guys were cautioned. We were all cautioned that we we designed that road for a long term, but it, it needs to be paved. It needs to be paved and tiled correctly. Uh, Mr. Gerald is absolutely adamantly 
uh, refusing to go that way. Um, Mr. Millington has discussed with our legal, maybe we can strong arm them, but in the bottom line, we want to be good neighbors too. Okay, so. I don't know anybody know Mr. Gerald personally. He's a, he's a nice guy, um, lonely guy. Um, but, you know. Cool. Thank yeah. you. If you're not doing anything Thursday morning, who can come see me? <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for suggesting that. Um, EO reports 2.4 and 2.5. Um, 2.4 is uh, financial planning, which is pertinent given all the work that we're doing to try to figure out all the changes this year due to the le legislation. Um, but it's really about ensuring that the budgeting process considers changes in the legislation, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Any trends that can be anticipated, so I do report compliance um, at this point in time, and I don't know if there's questions on 2.4. Um, usually this is the first read. This is the first read. Yeah. yeah. And then 2.5 is emergency superintendent succession, and the purpose of that is self-evident. Um, we do have an assistant superintendent. Um, the other thing is that this report contains the instructions to the board um, should you have to uh, change authority uh, at any point in time. Uh, there's a, a process to go through notifying kind of some of the state agencies and the, the um, secretary of education and whatnot. So that's all in this report if you ever need it. Questions? Is this is the procedure for um, temporary delegation of authority somewhere other than in this report? Is it in a? Is yeah, it in there's a. Um, it, the, what's in the report came from the actual guidance from the AOE. They have an actual okay. form that they, they sent out to explain the process. A lot of it is um, just the board, you know, providing the authority. Most of the powers are signatory. Um, so that the AOE is notified, right? The you know, board delegated the authority, and we're notifying the AOE so they know who the signatory is. Um, that way they know what to accept when they see it. Uh, policy C9 Wellness and Comprehensive Health. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. This is the second read. Mm -hmm. um, the changes uh, that were compelled um, were in the first read. There have been no subsequent changes. Um, any questions or concerns on uh, required policy C9, wellness and comprehensive health? It's kind of depressing. That's my comment. Okay. It's the anti cupcake policy. <laughs> as, as I mentioned in our last meeting, I chose the most lenient language that does leave a small amount of room for celebratory foods. <laughs> we need to vote on this one? Yeah, we have to vote. To move to accept. Um, oh, our board chair had to step away from it. Well, do we need to, we don't, it's just part of the consent agenda, right? Is it? No. Is no. It? It's separate. It's separate. You could move to add it to the consent agenda. No, yes, you no, I move to accept um, policy C9, the wellness and comprehensive health policy. The required, I should say. Yeah. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Sam. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No. Aye. Oh. Aye. Yes, sir. Aye. So judgmental. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Hesitatingly, unanimously uh, accepted. Oh, we did that one. Okay, budget overview. Here we go. Do you really want to? <laughs> <laughs> can't table this one. As much as we wanted to accept so, that. So a lot of this is about choices. Um, and so, you know, especially in terms of talking about the technical center budget, there's a couple of choices there. 
in talking about the potential Orange Southwest district budget. There's three choices there for the board to consider and you can kind of mix and match. So the goal would be able to walk away with a little bit of direction about kind of where the board is, is feeling that, that we should be kind of directing our energy. Um, recognize that there are three budgets that the Orange Southwest School District manages um, and they're all completely separate. There's the Orange Southwest District budget as a whole, which um, deals with our schools. There is the Technical Center budget, um, which is completely separate. That's mostly funded by tuition plus um, some grant support from the state. And then there is the Raven program um, budget. And so we'll talk about all three of those tonight. Um, one of the things to be aware of, um, and the thing that I'm trying to do, especially with this budget, um, is just trying to maximize options. Um, the 24-25 district budget um, is really designed to serve a few kind of important roles. There's quirks in the new education funding legislation that we're, we're dealing with right now that if we use it effectively, it's gonna open up kind of a greater range of budget options in the later years. We've got this five year kind of adjustment period, right? State made a lot of changes and said, okay, we're, we're gonna put some caps on things and we're gonna give you five years to, to figure out how to manage stuff and get everything in line. So when the five years is up and the caps go away, you're not in kind of a catastrophic place. Um, so our primary goal is kind of maximizing these options so that the next administrator, the next superintendent, has a wider variety of strategies that they can employ to manage what's going to be a difficult five-year period uh, for budget development. Um, in addition, and one of the things that I think is really important because this will have a, a, an impact on staff, um, is we've got to contend with the fact that there's going to be a significant loss in grant funding this year. The ESSER grants, the COVID era grants mm -hmm. that have been supporting about $1.5 million worth of personnel this year are gone at the end of this year. Um, so this is going to have a major impact on the services that we're able to currently provide to students. And stop me or, or talk with me at any point in time. Um, if things get a little confusing. Some of this is gonna make more sense to folks that deal with, with budget stuff a little bit more, but I'm gonna try to hopefully make some sense for folks here. Um, I think the big thing is to kind of review from last month the quirks and the law so we can figure out how to use them. And then the numbers that we're gonna talk about that are in this slide, they're really used as an example uh, to illustrate how the new legislation functions. Um, the legislature pretty much figured out the districts would need some time to adjust to the education funding overhaul. Um, so they did build in this five year adjustment period. And during this adjustment period, they added some guardrails that we can use to kind of maximize our budget options. And that's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing to recognize um, is that there is a 5% cap on school tax rates. And this was to help districts who are going to suffer a loss in funding due to the new legislation, of which we are one, right? If we want to be able to maintain what we did last year because of this change and we're, we've lost money, we're going to have to make up for it somehow just to be back to where we were to keep ourselves whole. And for an example, um, let's say that we need to increase our tax rate by 8% to make up the funding loss. Our community will only have to manage a 5% increase. That's what the cap means, right? We ask for 8%. Um, they're only going to charge us for 5 but they'll give us the full amount for the 8%. There is a reckoning, and we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, however. Um, if we depend upon that extra 3%, right? We're going to 8, 3% above the, the, um, the cap. Um, if we depend upon that 3% by making a permanent part of our budgets going forward, we'll have to increase our budget in five years to cover. As long as we eliminate that additional 3% or anything that's above the 5% over the next five years, um, we won't be on the hook for it when 2030 comes around. Does that make a little bit of sense? So they're helping us out a little bit, um, and they're saying, yeah, if you go over it, there may be a reckoning, but we're giving you five years to get that straightened out. We so had talked. Can I just? Yeah. So by 2030, our budgets need to be increasing only by 5%, not by 8%. Is that what you're saying? Our, ta our tax rates. Um, so I'm using this as an example. Right. It's probably easier to look at. So if we were to stick at the 5% cap and not go over the 5% cap for tax rates, 
This is what would happen with our budget. And these are fairly realistic numbers compared to our budget over the course of the next five years. Right? Let's say that, hey, you know, we have extra additions there. We've got some challenges in our district that are going on right now. So we're going to go over that 5% cap. We're going to go to 8% every year. And the reason that we're going to do that is maybe to help out a little bit with um, the challenging behaviors we have at RES and Braintree and Brookfield and try to preserve some of the faster <coughs> era people that we've hired on board. So if we go to 8%, what ends up happening is at the end of the five, five years, right, this is where our budget's going to be that we're depending upon. This is where it would be if it were just the 5%. But the problem is when we get to that fifth year, we're now on the hook for all that additional above the 5% cap, so that which would be, really be about four or five million dollars we'd have to make up in that one year. That's the cliff. So we can't do that because that would be really irresponsible. No, we can't, but there's some games to play that we probably do want to play. We are going to be over the 5% anyway this first year just because just because of the increases that we've got in staff salaries, the 16, 17% increase in, in healthcare, increases in SPED, which are all kind of mandatory, which I'll show on a different slide. But so if we stay under, we'll go through the kind of summary here because I think it'll really play it out well for folks. If we stay at or under the 5% cap for each of the next five years, the district's going to be in good stead as there will be no additional money we're on the hook for it come 2030. If we go over the 5% cap and don't do anything to eliminate the excess during the five-year adjustment period, we will have a fiscal cliff in 2030, right? And the example that we just talked about shows what the district would face if it exceeded the cap by 3% each year and made that extra money a permanent part of each budget going forward. In year 2030, we need to suddenly raise an additional 4.6 million just to maintain the previous year's level of funding. The best solution that I am proposing, and then I'll give you the logic for this, is if the taxpayers are willing, is to exceed the 5% cap, but by a very small amount. The 5% cap only exists if it is used in the previous year. If we don't use it, we lose it permanently. Right? If we go over that 5% cap, maybe we go to 5.1% um, each of the five years, that means that we have the option of going above 5% and not paying for it in the coming years so that if something catastrophic happens, we have maneuverability, right? Oh my God, we had something that we couldn't anticipate that just blew up um, and uh, it's gonna cost an awful lot to, to, to manage our way through it. And so as long as we're hitting that 5% cap just a little bit over, we'll always have access to it over the five years. So to maximize the district's budget op options, I recommend exceeding the cap by a small amount. This way the cap's benefits are available to use in future years if something catastrophic happens and the fiscal cliff we'll have to deal with in 2030 will be small. Right? Go over a little bit, yeah, we're gonna have to pay for it in the end, but you know what, if we get to the end of five years and that fiscal cliff is $50,000 in a 25 to $30 million budget, not that big a deal. Next year, which is year one of the five, we will exceed the 5% cap just to cover our mandatory costs. How far we exceed it will be up to the board in terms of additional spending. All right, and the one thing that I want to talk to you about right now is this idea that we're still missing um, data from the state. Typically at this time, I'd be able to talk with the community about what their actual tax rates might be in each of these scenarios. We do not have that information yet. At the latest, we're supposed to have it by law by January 1st. They've already written to us and said they won't have it in time. I don't know what that means. Um, that might mean that there might need to be a special board meeting or two to make sure that we're hitting our time windows for your budget vote, because there's a certain amount of time between when you have the final vote on the, the budget and when we have the actual um, vote in March. And so we've got to make sure we hit those time frames. So, all right, a um, couple of parts and pieces here. So, explain them. so, I've split this up into two different pockets of funding. We've got what's mandatory. In other words, we've got to do it because it's required under contract. Um, it's required to provide services to special education students that are it's required under federal law. Um, there was also another little tricky thing that the uh, legislators slipped in that 
nobody really knew about. We found out about it about a month ago, and that's the early education child care tax. They are trying to get early education, right? Preschools across the state, but they had no funding mechanism. So they slipped into the law um, a little tax that they charge every district on the cost of their staff. Right? So our staff salaries have a little bit of tax on, on it that we're gonna have to pay. Um, the other things that are mandatory is they are resetting what's called the tier one funding. And this will take a little bit of ex explanation, but hopefully it's pretty simple. When the state back in the 90s decided that education was fundamentally unequal in the state of Vermont, they tried to equalize what they were giving to students. And so the first thing that most people are familiar with is what's called the yield, right? The yield is how much the state gives us per student, and that's how much it gives everybody per student across the state. That's the equalization, because they're saying, hey, there's a certain amount of money that's required to give students a proper education, and if we believe in equality, we have to make sure that every student in the state gets the same amount. Last year, the yield was about $15,400. This year, it's about $9,400. Okay, so there was a huge change in the yield. Now, to make sure with all the changes that happened um, in terms of the legislation, to make sure that they're adequately funding education with all these changes, they have to reset that tier one funding uh, platform. And so that's what the, the tier one funding is that equality money, right? That you're, it's what we used to call the yield. To reset that based upon the new legislation is going to require an 18.5% increase in tax rates across the state, right off the bat. So they're resetting what's required for equality of education within the state. So everybody is subject to this. So right off the bat, if you own a $250,000 house in the state of Vermont, you can expect your taxes to go up $650. Right off the bat before we do anything. So it's important to recognize. Um, the other piece that's unknown right now, which hopefully will be known after tonight, is the tuition impact of the technical center, because that's one of the things you'll be looking at and hopefully voting on. Um, we send 60 students to the tech center, so if their tuitions go up, we pay more, and that impacts the OSSD budget, right, because the RTCC budget is separate from ours. So the things that we've talked about, there were tons and tons of things that folks wanted that felt was important in these challenging times. Um, we've reduced them down to just a few. And so I have three options for you and you could mix and match these if the board chooses and I'll talk about each one and why they're important. The first one is kind of the maximum option. So this is our discretionary funding. Stuff that we should do, but we don't, don't have to. But there's probably going to be a cost if we don't. So the first thing is that we've been building this uh, full-day preschool for four-year-olds. Two of the sites um, are funded in the regular budget already. One of the sites was being funded with the ESSER funding, with the grant, right, to get it up and to make sure that everybody had access across the district. That ESSER funding is going away, so we have to move that money if we want to preserve that preschool program um, into the regular budget. There are four people associated with that, a teacher and three paraprofessionals. The cost to move it into the regular budget is 153000 Nurses. So this is an important piece. So we heard folks talk a little bit earlier about um, the idea that yeah, you know, they don't have um, these mental health supports. It's not because the money wasn't provided, it's because we can't find them. And so that's an important piece to know. So we have been trying to provide those supports to the other schools, but finding them is incredibly difficult, especially um, Braintree um, has had the most problems this year in terms of challenging behaviors. Um, why the nurses are so important um, is that they are a calming presence in the building. Many of them know how to de-escalate children. Uh, if we have full-time nurses in the two smaller buildings, they will have a little bit of time on their hands above and beyond the medical assistance that they provide during the day. And with a little training, they can be kind of part of our mental health team that helps to work with the students, right? The student comes in, they're dysregulated. Um, we don't have a lot of other resources, but the nurse can sit down for 10 or 15 minutes 
go through a de-escalation um, technique with the student, get them back down into a good space so they can get back into class. So it would be maximizing um, that resource. Um, the requirement, we have enough nurses around the building, uh, around the district, that if we increase this by the equivalent of one um, full nursing position, we would have a nurse in each school um, to be able to provide that service. And again, the idea is covering what we can't with our other mental health services because there just aren't enough people out there. And all the districts have been competing for them over the last couple of years. Um, the custodian, I've kind of split this up in the last day, so this is not going to quite match what's in your, your packets. Um, we need an additional custodian or two if we're really going to do a, a, a good work keeping up on everything that we've got to keep up on in terms of cleanliness in the building. Um, the other piece that's on here is a payroll assistant for central office. We do not have a human resources person. Um, I primarily serve that role for 262 people, but parts of that role are also ferried out to the other staff um, within the central office, um, people whose job it is not to do payroll, um, especially our two, uh, our payroll specialist and our assistant business manager. Um, are being kind of overwhelmed um, in terms of the HR piece here. So what I am suggesting um, is that we bring in another assistant, a payroll assistant, um, who could act as the assistant superintendents or whoever the second body is uh, in the district next year, partially as their secretary, but also provide support either to help out payroll, to do some of the more minor functions, to take them off the plate of the folks that are there, or potentially to take off their plate some of the, the HR functions, the more basic ones. Um, and so I think that's very important. I've got people that are burning out in there um, this year, and I don't want to lose them. Um, school resource officer is on there in this first cut. The school resource officer fits into kind of the same category for me as the nurses. I've always had one in every district. <coughs> um, their primary role, um, it's nice to have them there for safety, but 90, 95% of their time um, is being a mentor to students, a big brother, a big sister, somebody they can depend upon, a good role model, somebody that they can talk to, somebody that can help out in the household if there are things that are going on in there, somebody who can provide safety checks. Um, they are typically very highly looked up to um, by the students, and I've had students that, you know, when they were struggling a little bit and needed somebody to talk to, that's the only person they trusted to go talk to. So that's one of the reasons to kind of consider it now. Again, it's another kind of alternative way of getting at some of those mental health issues. So this would be the, the Cadillac plan. Um, and there's a couple other pieces in here to, to recognize. Um, we've got the mandatory. That doesn't change in any of our scenarios. And some of it is still unknown. We don't know. Um, what the new tax rate is going to be. Um, my guess is it's going to be around, uh, it's going to go from 1.39 to 1.64. So this means that right now, under the old base for tier one funding, people were paying $1.39 for every $100 of assessed value. Just to reset this because of the new legislation, it's going to go to $1.64. The 5% cap does not count on this money. So that happens anyway. The 5% cap counts on this one. So our discretionary stuff. So a couple of other numbers in here. So this is the subtotal of the mandatory. This is the subtotal of the additional asks and discretionary. This is the two added up together. So this budget would require a $2 million increase um, because we've done our homework and we've done a pretty good job in using our yearly surpluses to subsidize taxes. I have a million, a little over a million dollars uh, that we can apply to subsidizing taxes this year. So kind of with this unknown sitting here, that's about how much we'd be asking for the taxpayers. It's within our control. Can I just ask you to repeat to make sure I understood? The 5% cap applies only to the discretionary. Thank you. Okay. So they call it tier one and tier two. Tier one is what's required for given. Yeah, okay. the, for every student. Anything we want for our kids above and beyond that, that's tier two. That goes into what they call the liability pool. So any other district that wants money above tier one, we all ask for it from the state. 
and then they ask all the taxpayers in the in the state to come up with that money and then they give it to us. So all the taxpayers across the state. Um, the second possibility is uh, reducing these costs a little bit. It would be reducing the custodian in the 6% uh, increase the custodial supplies. Um, the real kind of bare bones budget would keep um, the payroll assistant and would keep the preschool regular budget. And so this would be a place for some discussion. Um, or if you feel that there should be other options that we should be moving folks around. I need a, I need a, a basic direction. I don't want to take, I want the nurse in there. I, I, I feel, um, I, I think I'm mental health wise is critical. Putting, <coughs> it in there. So I hear a nurse. So just to, just to be clear on the tier two stuff that all the districts get to ask for. And it, we, that will raise this. We want to be as close to 5% as we can be. This year, we're, there, there's no way in heck we're going to make it because between we're going to be over. Yeah, just be just on the mandatory stuff, we're going to be over. We're going to be around 7.77 percent, I think, at the last calculation, just on the mandatory stuff. We don't want to go over 10, but the because then we have to go and explain it to the. We don't want to be under. Yeah. Right, because then we're paying for everybody else's we'll extra lose. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's going to happen We're is that you're going to have a tough year this year, but you got four years to figure it out. And I've already talked with the cabinet. We have some plans in place that they are considering for future years so that they have their ducks in a row and whoever comes in next can take a look at that. That's something we can talk about in executive session at some point in time if you want. And some districts are planning to spend 9.9%, .9%, just not on salaries, things that can be taken out of the budget after the five years. Like modernization funds. Oh yeah, I was gonna say I don't see what you can add that you could take out, but yeah, one time, one time yeah. thing. But, one the, time but thing. the problem, the problem is the people that are doing that, that comes in that liability pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if if we're being prudent, mm -hmm. as we should be, because taxes are going to be high for everybody, and some districts are going to nine point nine percent, everybody else is paying for them not being prudent. That's right. So there's an ethical component to this as well. Just to throw some folks. Yeah, there were a lot of people that were talking about doing I that. I know. I don't know if they, they understand or not. But somewhere between five and ten. As close as to five said. as we can get. Yeah, and I would I would argue I would argue, yeah, as close to five, because that'll that'll keep a small clip. And if we still get our surpluses and people use it the way that I've been using it, <laughs> you may be able to cover that clip pretty handily when we get. So other things that the board, based upon the discussion out of these things, wants to make sure that we preserve. Well, the, the preschool, I the yeah. first two I see as kind of not, for me, are not okay. Okay. Doesn't mean we'll be able to pass the budget, mm -hmm. but we're going to try like the Dickens. Any other comments, thoughts? So the payroll assistant would be a new position as well, as well as the... Yeah, that, that central office, um, in talking with uh, the older staff, like Linda Lubold and Sue, when she was here, they had between three and seven other people in there at one time. And so they, part of it is I've got, they're, they're burning out. Um, how, much, how many staff are there currently? I've got three administrative assistants, a business manager, myself, and Student Services Director. Okay. I did mention you too, didn't I? I know. I apologize. And Heather. <laughs> and Heather. Which is, and Heather's only been the last year. But you know, the biggest, the biggest piece that is missing from this whole scenario. HR. If you've, got a, if you've got a new superintendent that's coming in, who is going to be a visionary who you want doing big leadership things, you need to free them up so they can do that. HR is the way to attack that. Mm -hmm. If you can take the 262 people off their plate, um, so they're only dealing with you know super major issues that might come up once once a year, once every other year, you are going to be in much better stead. Uh, mm -hmm. Is my recommendation. Okay. 
So we do payroll all in-house currently. No outside service. No, we actually even brought on to try to help. Uh, we brought in Tyler. We've been digitizing everything um, to try to transfer over because it's a little bit more efficient. You're not shuffling all the paper around. It's still not enough. Yeah. I see the value in an HR person as a as another point of priority. I agree. The first two lines are important to me. HR or, or a, a smaller payroll. HR, HR person's gonna be 150-ish range, um, which is fine. I, I think it's, it's, especially with the legality of everything that they deal with. Yeah. Um, I, I understand the cost difference. I guess the role, the more important side of the role in my mind would be the HR function. Whether you title it that or not. Okay. When we when we talked about when we talked about adding an assistant superintendent, we talked about whether we would add an assistant superintendent or an HR person in that spot. Yeah. Um, so as we are looking at changes in our district leadership when you know when we have a new superintendent we're all thinking the same thing should we should we be having an HR person instead of an assistant superintendent or <coughs> the other piece um, in the background um, again one of the reasons that I chose an assistant superintendent was because I wanted to make sure that succession was in place because mm -hmm. I was not really planning on returning um, the HR piece, I think, is, is vitally important, but you could also keep the assistant superintendent. I have um, two curriculum directors that are both getting ready to retire. Um, they're gonna be in a reduced role next year. Um, I brought one in for K-12 for math and one in for K-12 uh, ELA. Um, and both of them have done an absolutely amazing job. Um, we built in teacher leaders this year to be able to take over a lot of the remaining functions. So as those folks go, those resources could be shifted to maintaining an assistant superintendent, who one of their primary roles um, typically is curriculum. As a curriculum director. Yeah, they do grants, they do curriculum, um, and half a dozen other things, equity coordination in, in, in your case, but it's, it's a gigantic job. Um, curriculum alone is, is enough for but I've also been doing some HR things too. It's like we're chopped up all these jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there could be some restructuring um, that could possibly benefit the bottom line. Sounds like, sounds like it. That, and also job satisfaction and, uh, and hopefully retention. Longevity. Yeah. And the curriculum directors, neither are grant funded. One is. One is. One is. So then that's not kind of. But it's on but a level money. That doesn't that means that if they go, that position that replaces it could be grant funded as well. Partially. We have to change the title to get it into real estate plan, but hmm. so it's not ESSER funded. No, it's, it's title. Right, it's title. Yeah. You can get it good every year. Easy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so so what I'm hearing make sure i'm clear on this as i as i put rob into work because it's a lot of number crunching um nurse preschool hr professional yeah and i'd be interested in hearing um it sounds like there is some opinion on this restruct like what the restructuring could potentially look like um, among as you were kind of alluding to and i'll leave that discussion up yeah. to you i mean I yeah i think we get the yeah. people i think we get people who want to say how's this going to work is kind of my mm -hmm. my thought I don't know we can talk more about it Heather. yes <clears throat> about all right. all any right. vision that you might have yes after being boots on the ground mm -hmm. okay so RTCC um, there's deeper discussion we could have if we need to um, but I think things are kind of straightforward um, Heather can help out a little bit with this too, too if there's other questions that come up. 
But the, the big thing about the tech center is that um, we had a dramatic increase in tuitions uh, a, a year or so ago. Um, that had a huge impact on our budget. Um, it drove up our budget by another 250 to 300,000. Plus it impacts the willingness of uh, our sending schools to send students here. Um, so I just want to put that kind of in the background. Total budget uh, for the tech center. Um, if we do this, that's what it would be. That would be the increase in tuition. Um, what we're talking about, and this was some good ideas that Nika and Heather were working on, was combining the dental program with the health program. Health program has had low numbers lately. The dental program has had low numbers, and it's been incredibly hard um, to get a dental person to come in. We've had fantastic people, but they're usually short-lived. They can make a lot more money elsewhere. So the idea would be to combine the two programs. Dental would be uh, a unit um, under the health program, so we're still using our equipment. And our current uh, dental teacher seems to be pretty tickled at the idea of being able to come in and, and just do it for you know a couple of weeks each year. Yep. Um, and so we kind of planned that into the budgeting piece is paying her a statement uh, to be able to do that. Are the we, other, go ahead. Are we funding that out of Perkins or are we funding that out of? Uh, it was originally funded through a grant called Time, which is for uh, creating new equipment or uh, uh, new programs or modernizing programs. But there were qualification issues, right? And so that grant paid for it for, uh, but this year it, for the first time it was in the local budget. The grant had um, been exhausted, the program had been launched. So currently that's in the local budget and uh, there's only four students in that program and then in health careers um, there's under 10 is it I think so I can look it up um, and so uh, one instructor can have up to 16 students so by putting those programs together right we're saving money but we're still providing pathways to both of those career paths or or even more we're thinking of adding EMT as a possibility so students could attend this program and then earn various uh, tier two IRCs, like the industry recognized credentials, based on their passion, they could pursue it. So we're not looking to cut, we're really looking to combine. Yeah, yeah, I was just and trying to remember that. The other, other piece that would happen in this scenario is now you have a, a space in the building that opens up and they've got some new ideas for programs that would go in there. So it's not like, you know, we're gonna be losing enrollment. The idea is, right, they're getting one program from the two that's gonna have pretty good enrollment. Um, and then it's opening up a space where they can build hopefully another high draw sort of program. What are the drawbacks? For which? For combining, Com combining those yeah. two? If we did have 30 or 40 applications for the two programs, we would want to re-expand in the future. But we're not taking anything, we're not taking anything off the table. And you because if the tuition jumps at 20%, um, the funding pathways are different. So the way the tech center is funded is they take a, an average of six semesters, they average that enrollment, and that's the number of ADM that or tuition that you get. But if you have a sudden jump of 20%, you get actual, actual enrollment. So th if that happened, we could afford to hire another teacher with that bump up. So the, the only downside is, I guess, it's a little bit sad to take away a full dental program and make it a part of the health careers program. But that program has struggled a bit. It has. Since launching already. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it could always be built up in the future if the interest is there. Um, but we're not getting, we, we have So better to maintain it yes. and maintain it in a more robust setting as a combination than to have it continue to decline and then have to lose it completely or something. Right, because when a program <coughs> is below eight students for three consecutive years, yeah. it's generally looked at or yeah, The other, other piece I think that's important and one of the things that's kind of hindered us a little bit, um, when Heather's talking about you know the, the three years, the six, six semester averaging, they, they look at the average students over, over six semesters over three years, and they give us money by student based upon that average. 
that's really great if your numbers are declining, right? Because mm -hmm. your average is higher than the number of students you have, so you have plenty of funding to be able to serve those students. Mm -hmm. Our problem is, is our numbers were going up. They weren't hitting the 20% increase threshold, so they're giving us funding. I think last year they were giving us funding for, for, for 126 kids when we actually had 154. And so that also had an impact on, on, on our tuitions a little bit. So it takes some time if those numbers stay high for the averages to catch up. Uh, the state, when they put that in place, they were assuming everybody's enrollments were begin, be going down, and that wasn't happening here. So the other piece that was added uh, a, a year or so ago was uh, a dean of students. Um, and that person was brought in at the time primarily to help out um, with student discipline. That role has changed uh, this year. Um, the, the new dean is actually doing a lot of curriculum work um, within uh, the technical center, which is helpful in kind of bringing the student scores up, which is one of the things that the state was worried about. Uh, but he's also doing um, some discipline as well. And so it is, it is kind of an important position there. It is currently being paid for um, through ESSER funding, which dries up. So if we're gonna keep the dean position, we're gonna see a $634 increase in student tuitions, right, for each student that comes into the tech center next year. If we combine the dental with the health programs, just like we talked about, but we remove the dean position, in other words, we don't put it into the regular budget, we'll actually see a $388 per student decrease. Um, calculations on this for us, um, 60 times 634, it's probably about $40,000 um, that it would increase the OSSD budget if we keep the dean. Um, just to put numbers into perspective. How important is the dean? Oh, okay. So, um, so really, like, that's like really a nice question. Like how important is this person? Right, the job degree? right. That's not really what I meant to ask. So no, it, wrong, but it's, it's. Uh, in last school year, uh, the person's primary responsibility was uh, dean work doing discipline. But this year, we hired a different person, and their primary responsibility is um, uh, improving academic outcomes. That is their number one. And that's been an issue at the, at the tech center. But, right? um, a real serious issue. Yeah, the kids, because, kids that come in are from all over the place, all mm -hmm. different backgrounds from all different schools. Mm -hmm. so. Many of the students are on plans at various levels, and many are two grade levels or below um, actual grade level in outcomes. And so making sure there's intervention groups, making sure that there is, you know, we're meeting the students where they are and helping them move forward is his primary role. Um, the numbers are promising. We have seen an improvement in uh, the academic scores, and I mean, from a passion point of view, I want to see it persist. I want to see this through. Um, however, I don't see enough money in the Perkins grant, which is the equivalent of title for tech. There's just not enough <coughs> money there to fund it completely through Perkins. So at least a portion, if we want to keep this role, at least a portion of it has to go into the budget. The other, other piece that he serves, which is critical, uh, if we can actually get it up and running and have people attend, is he is the adult event coordinator. Mm. So there's a possibility that if we get some interesting programs going, and he's got a pretty tall order starting second semester to get some programs going, that you know we're raising at least minor tuition money coming in from uh, the adults that want to come in. Um, so that's the other role. That's a, actually assistant director is the one that's required by the state, not an actual director. So, so there, those are two pretty different recommendations. Yeah, and that's what is your, what is your recommendation? <laughs> the two. They both are good. I would actually, and I hate increasing funding and tuitions and things. I would actually go with this one. Uh, for the simple fact that, like I said, you have students that are coming in from Williamstown, from Northfield, from Randolph, um, their academic careers prior to um, haven't always been top notch. Um, and so when they do take the state testing, um, they perform poorly. Um, and the state has actually called us on that. It was one of yeah. the reasons why we built um, in another English teacher and a math teacher over there um, was to try to get those skills bolstered. So at least for now, I would say keep um, the person. 
Curriculum work is a quirky thing. In three years, um, you can get most of it done. And then it should be handed off um, to the actual staff to keep it maintained and do the, the periodic reviews. How often do you have to say curriculum work is kind of a funny thing. How often do you have to have somebody who's a curriculum director who's revamping your program? You that we, we've been kind of get it up and running and it kind of self sustains been, and then how often do you generally need to so we've been starting kind of from scratch. Um, when I started here, there wasn't, it, it was sporadic. There were plate social studies at high school was awesome. Um, elementary had the bridges program that they were kind of using, kind of not depending upon which school you were in. So it took um, four or five years. And of course, some of that was because COVID slowed things down for um, Catherine and Betty to be able to do the math and the EL work and get the curriculum documents up get them running, get people using them, get people referring to them as they do their daily lesson planning. Um, so that is all in place, and now we're at a position where we've got the assessment systems that are in place within the schools as well. We're training the actual teacher leaders that we hired how to facilitate those conversations. Here's the data, what does, it, what does it imply about what the students learned? Did they meet the standards that we taught? If they didn't, which ones did they not meet? And what are we gonna do differently right here and now to make sure that they meet them before we move on? And so once you get to that cultural piece where the staff are managing it, then the curriculum directors can go away. The only time that you would have a need, um, potentially, of either another curriculum director or a consultant coming in from the outside to do this work is if there's like a major change in state legislation and, and, and they're throwing out Common Core and they're going with a, a new curriculum. Um, the document should be reviewed probably every three years, but that's something that a local team of teachers can do um, with, with the right guidance in-house, um, just to make sure that things are still aligned with the mission. And to actually frame this for how this hits our budget, the difference between those two numbers is about $350. And if you say around 60 students, that's 15,000, which is less than the tuition of one student. So if it improves outcomes for 60 of our students. So what's, what's 634 times 60? No, I deducted the two numbers. Oh, they, have, no, they have nothing to do with each other. They do, of course they, they do. If so we if, say we, if, we go, if we go <laughs> if we go to this plan. Oh, is that a negative? That's yeah. a negative. If we go with this plan. We're going down the tuition? How is that possible? If we got rid of the dean. The but dean's in the do, on a grant. Do 634 times 60. The dean's on a grant. Because like I said, I think it's about... No, it's much more than I thought. I think it's 35. Because I thought the difference between those two numbers was 300, but it's 900. And that's so, what it's, about. so it's much more. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's about, about 35 to 40,000 if we go with the one on this side, yeah. which, again, it might cause some of the sending schools to balk in terms of our budget and mm -hmm. school. Um, it's an increase, but it's, it's tiny. So you guys get the vote on this. Because I need these numbers to be able to fill in one of those red boxes on the OSSD budget for the next time. So the two that you need to vote on will be the Tech Center budget, one of the recommendations, or something else that you come up with on, on your own, um, and then the Raven budget, which is really simple. We'll talk about that. What are the other Tech Center tuitions around our area? Are we, are we way over Yeah, uh, we're number three. Compared to the other ones? Are they comparing full day to full day or full yeah, day to half day? Probably. Some are half day, but the tuitions, we're number, we're number three in the list. Uh, Southwest Tech, wherever that is, is the highest. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, we had a couple of things that happened that caused the surge in our, our tuition. Um, our tuition used to be in the 18-19 range. Um, Kind of stayed there because we don't. We're always trying to keep it under twenty, for whatever psychological reason. Crossing that twenty thousand dollars threshold always seemed to be a big deal. Um, but uh, Perkins, our TCC did not complete the Perkins grant one year. Yeah. Um, and what that meant was that the people that were in Perkins had to be paid for out of the regular budget until the grant was complete. And whenever you pay somebody out of the regular budget, they can never go back on a grant. And so there was a jump in our tuition that year because of that failure to get the Perkins grant done. So you'll see these are our, our tuitions, you know, kind of leading up. 
And then we had 18, 670, and then 20, 23, 24, it, it jumped like 4,000 bucks. The, per, the person can't go back or the position can't go back? Uh, the position can't go back. Dang. It's called supplanting. Once you pay for it out of the regular yeah. budget, you're, yeah. you're locked out. It, yeah. It's not all grants do that, but most of the federal grants do, which Perkins is. And how do we miss that? Dang. The person responsible didn't do it. I'll leave it, leave it at that, but those are people's things. Let me uh, maybe answer this earlier or mention it. Um, what are the enrollment projections looking like for our TCC? Um, so, Nika Oaks, the current director, has um, some vision to increase enrollment. Um, and uh, one of them is through another time grant to improve the educational program, modernize. Modernize is the language they like to use. And that would ex uh, keep the current educational services as it is and add on units in outdoor education yeah. to attract students into the profession. So should, we've written a grant to add kayaks and mountain bikes and skiing. Um, and we anticipate that that would significantly increase enrollment. And the other, um, we're hoping to fund again with a grant to uh, improve, modernize is the language they like, uh, uh, the ag program to add vet tech and some animal husbandry, which we anticipate that's already a full program that would double that program. We would be looking to um, add another adult because you can only have 16 to one, that's the highest ratio <coughs> allowable. So if we're successful with those initiatives, of course, we would hope enrollment would go up. But enrollment is not declining. It's sort of stagnant right now. That's why these visionary ideas to hopefully attract students are the way we would see to improve enrollment. They're currently at 128. That's FTE, just um, not actual students, because the pre-tech students are counted as half. Yeah. So actual students, I think, is 130. Well, we're getting the ADM, so our enrollments have been higher. Mm -hmm. So what the state is giving us for an average this year is higher than our current actual enrollment. I think we're getting like 134 is what they're paying us for. Mm -hmm. But the enrollment right now, um, from what I got last night, was was 128. Okay. Um, the programs, there are some programs that are performing really well. Um, Dental is low, uh, health careers, construction, uh, culinary, and ed services um, are all in that kind of five to eight range right now. The rest of them are between 11 and 16. Wow, construction is low. Yeah, so yeah hopefully it's a one year glitch. Yeah. Um, so I apologize, I was switching around. So you when you talk about some of these new initiatives that you're looking at or looking into potentially bringing on board in future years, does the facility currently, would it be able to support, like the current building would be able to support that student population and the potential expansion into those programs in the current space that we have? Or is that, would that be an issue? Yes, um, so Education Services currently has a very small enrollment. Uh, it's four, and some of those students are in full-time co-op. So if we could fill that program up to 16, the room is absolutely big enough for, for those students. We just currently don't have the enrollment. And also, again, with others, yes. So the answer is yes. We would be maximizing on facilities we already have. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 goal, the goal would be to get every one of the programs up to, okay. yep. up to, up to 14 to 16, which would get us up around 160. Um, and that's about the capacity that, that, that we just right now. And if we can make that jump, as I told you, it changes our funding. Mm -hmm. So thoughts on either of these two? Like I said, if I can get, recommend the board to, to vote on one or the other, um, that way that'll feed back into the OSSD for next year and allow um, Robin also to get her announced tuitions done. Oh. I mean, I will. I, I, I'm concerned that we're already one of the higher mm -hmm. programs. Um, 
I mean, my op, you know, my my choice would be to not lose the steen and to move them to the local budget, but then that would bring our proposed tuition up. So, you know, and I don't know, we can't, you know, foresee what the other schools would be doing too, is if we're staying kind of in line with increases around the, the other school districts, or if other districts are working to lower theirs, and then ours is gonna look like a significant jump in comparison to what other districts are doing. And I don't know what the other districts are, this is this year's data. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they're gonna be next year. They could all have jumps next year, I don't know. Um, I don't expect there to be major changes uh, in the tuition rates for the other CTV staff. I mean, I do agree with combining the dental health program. I think that that does make sense, obviously. Um, and kind of coming up with just the healthcare fields, and I, you know, maybe exploring that other option of ENT down the road too, I think would be interesting. I wouldn't anticipate that many will go down in tuition, given with the, just the cost of goods yeah. has gone up. And, right? And this isn't even fat asking for any increase on any other lines at all. They're saying that nobody else will go down. I don't think so. I can't anticipate it with the way the cost of everything has gone up. I, 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 I don't, I would not, I would be surprised to see a tuition go down. And as folks build new programs, Mm -hmm. It will, over time, be possible to start building personnel back into Perkins, which should help. And if we can keep our enrollments up and keep that average high, and keep that average climbing like it's been doing the last couple of years, um, that will help too. Because right? every additional kid, we get another chunk of money from the state, as well as tuition from the setting school. At this point in the year, do we know how many of our students are planning on heading to the next summer? Are we still no. at about 60, or do we don't know? I don't think it's it's much different than most years. Uh, typically, you don't get a real number until after the first couple of weeks of, of the year of the school year Maybe after school. it starts, because some of them will switch programs, some of them will decide it's not for them. You'll you'll get some additions as well. Unless there's a significant change up it won't change the funding. So if it were to drop or stay steady, we know what's coming based on the six semester average. Yeah. And there's a certain window, either 15 or 20 <coughs> days within the, the year, I don't remember which month it is for the tech centers that they actually take a look at what the student enrollments are. That's what they use for the calculations. They make everything simple. And there's no grant available to keep the dean on a grant funded position in a grant funded position? Um, you know, I, I, I keep my eyes open for grants and currently there isn't anything. Okay. However, I never know what's coming. You know, so a grant could be opened up next month that would be a perfect fit for, um, they might open something. It would not surprise me to see a grant specifically to help districts who are dealing with this ESSER cliff. Um, I, but currently there is not anything. Not an election I could, year, there won't be. There won't be. <laughs> not an election year. Okay, I guess not. Um, we could put a portion on Perkins. I think we could, we could absorb um, about $30,000, which is not a ton, out of a $100,000 total benefit package cost, but we could put that on Perkins. The other component to just keep in the back of people's minds is that um, 
the legislature has been working for three years now on revamping the education funding for CTE centers. Um, so we've been expecting a major beneficial change, um, not a cut, a, a beneficial change for about three years now, and it will be on the legislative agenda this time. I don't think, given the other tax implications that people are going to be dealing with this year, I don't think they'll be able to do much. Um, but they, they've been working on it for a while, so eventually something will happen, whether it's two, three, four, five years down the road. It does seem like it's the right time to be investing in technical education mm -hmm. and the development of such <laughs> and the promotion of such. And so if keeping the dean does that, I'm for keeping the dean. Yeah. Do you need a vote? Yeah. I move to... Uh, Go with option with recommendation one with combined dental health program and move deep and ask for the local budget. I second. Seconded by Rachel. All those in but oh further discussion? No. Um I'm good. Good. Good? Okay. Sorry. All those stuff mm -hmm. Sarah, any further discussion? She's good. Okay. She abstains. What's that? I said she abstains. She abstains. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Option one. Aye. Opposed? Extensions? Motion passes. All right, last piece here. Um, Raven Program uh, works with students with challenging behaviors. Uh, it is a school within itself um, that exists within the district. On average, it serves about three students from the district every year. Um, the other students actually come in from our sending schools to take advantage of the program. They typically have anywhere from 10 to 14 students at any given time. They all pay tuition um, to attend. It's kind of an outplacement. Um, and the tuition covers all of the um, costs of the program. The benefit to the district is that if we sent these particular students to any of the other outplacements, um, it would cost three to five times more um, than what we're paying. And our program is actually much more successful than many of the places that we could send them. This program, its existence uh, saves us about a million dollars every five to seven years um, in terms of what we'd have to pay uh, if the Raven program didn't exist. Um, the only increase this year, so they're going from 26,000 to 28,000 um, in terms of the tuition cost, um, which, is, which is very reasonable and all of it is coming from the, the salary increases um, that we negotiated with. And so this one would, would need a vote too if people are, are comfortable with it. Well, what are we voting on? Because isn't it required that we go with the tuition raises that we Sarah votes. Sarah. Sarah has a question, I think. Oh, oh she, she's muted. Should, do I have to unmute her? No, nope, she should be able to. We can, you can if you know how. Um, so this is uh, you just it's a uh, it's a vote to accept the change. Okay. Right. You kind of don't have a choice. Yeah. It's mandatory. That was, what I was, that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but it's not approved until the board says. It's just yeah. kind of maybe she was just voting. So so move to accept the proposed or the required budget. I'll yes, second. Budget and seconds. Further discussion. All those in favor of the motion. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Sarah. Opposed? No. Abstentions? No. Unanimously passes. I'm just sitting up here because it's warm. <laughs> is it, <laughs> is it, is it, this is, oh, these are cool. <laughs> I propose that during the... No. <laughs> and that is it, unless there are other questions about um, budgeting. What we'll do is we'll take the um, RTCC information. Um, we'll be able to hopefully continue to fill out you know what's currently missing and hopefully shortly after january 1st the state will have that 
final piece that we need to start calculating people's tax rates. When that happens, I will run my three informational meetings, one in each town. Um, and then depending upon what our timeline is, if it's required, I'll talk with uh, Anna and Chelsea about a potential special meeting just to make sure we're not missing our timelines. But it all depends on when we get that last information from the state. Um, um, now, this update on the internal investigation is still up here, but also to be discussed in executive session. So I think um, we'll skip it on the regular agenda if we've agreed, right? Yeah. Uh, so the, the board governance policies, 4.4 um, was a, a holdover, holdover was um, moved to tonight along with 4.5. 4.4 is the um, chair's role. 4.5 uh, code of conduct for board members. Um, 4.4. Let's start discussing. A specially empowered member of the board ensures the integrity of the board's process. Mm -hmm. Agree. Doing it. Okay. Yep. Occasionally re represents the board to outside parties. Yep. yep. Okay. Meeting discussion content will consist solely of issues that clearly belong to the board to decide or to monitor according to policy. We're consistent with that. Yep. Well, yeah. Information that is for neither monitoring performance nor board decisions will be avoided or minimized and always noted as such. Yep. Deliberation will be fair, open, and thorough, but also timely, orderly, and kept to the point. Yep. Yep. Uh, the authority of the chair consists in making decisions that fall within topics covered by board policies. Number one, yes, we're doing that. Sorry? I said number one, yes, we're doing it. We're doing the empowered to the and and Pam. Number two, the chair has no authority to make decisions about policies created by the board within ends and executive limitation policy areas. No authority to supervise or direct the superintendent. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do the board. Represent the board to outside parties in announcing board stated positions, stating chair positions and interpretations, and report such activity at the next meeting of the board. Yes. We're doing that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the chair may delegate this authority but remains accountable. Mm -hmm. The chair will ensure that the board fulfills its obligations and work to improve the board's performance. Yes. Yeah. Seems. Okay. It's a very Martin Wrightson scenario class, but when we're working on these policies, can we change things to gender neutral language today? Absolutely. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so was there anywhere people think that we need to sh sharpen, hone, no. get it together? No, you're doing a great job. In this one? Anything no. else? We're keeping you, we're keeping you accountable. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so code of conduct. Interesting. Yes. Is there anything in particular? I didn't see anywhere in this policy that needs to be adjusted. There was a him or her. There was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On, the um, chair one? Yeah, on the chair one, there was on, um, we just read it, number, sorry. Yeah, I'm just the same page. Um, on number three, yeah. within the area, delegated oh, yeah, to yes. her or him. Delegated to them. Who changes it? I don't know. Who does that? Who has the, who has the, um, or is it just a, who has the, like, the substance live document? We all have access to the document, I believe. But to make, I think you all, we all have editing, because it's a Google Doc, or it was a Google Doc. These charts you made? Yeah. Yeah. But they but are, the policy, but there are policies. Where's the policy? Right. Like, so if we make a language. Um, the web, make a sweeping, can we make a sweeping language sweeping. that like any any policies that we are reviewing to change language from 
to gender neutral of yeah. they and using they and them like sure. across the board. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, so uh, so I make a motion. I make a motion that anytime we are reviewing policy, if we see we change language to gender neutral language. Second. Second by Sam. Further discussion? But are are we going to charge someone to do yeah. that? It should be, well, yeah, Heather. We will charge Heather with making those adjustments as we review these policies. Okay. Amended to that. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, Thank you, Sarah. Aye. Aye. You were an I. I was an I. Opposed. <laughs> Abstentions. Passes unanimous. Um, the code of conduct. This is an interesting one, and I yeah. Tell me. Oh, did you want me to table this one? The next meeting. Well, I think to move yeah. along. A couple of minutes. Because we have this, we have another a lengthy. Yeah. 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 So I'd like to table this one for the time being, just so we can keep the moving the meeting moving along. It is a big one. Okay. In a small town. Yes. Um, great. So I, it's been requested we move this to the next month's agenda. Yes. Okay. We may be doing this regularly and kind of shifting it <laughs> yeah. time until we can Catch put up. two little ones together. Yeah. Um, okay. Tabled. Do we need to vote on that? That's a change to the agenda. I think we do. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I heard that that motion. And she seconded it. And you seconded it. Oh, I sure did. Mm -hmm. Rachel seconded it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Unanimously. Tabled till next month. Thank you. Uh, oh, the, the webinar. Just I, We don't need to have a discussion about it, but please do, if you haven't had a chance yet, please do listen to it. It's very, very informative. And of course, Pietro put some giggles in there for you, so it's like the hour long it is. Well, movie trivia in there for you. Um, policy decisions discuss need for two recommended policies. I Right. I can make this easy for you. Yep. Um, I don't have anything from legally. I, I made the first request on October 30th, requested again on December 7th, and again on 1214. I think they're just busy. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is that I won't bring it up again until I actually have a draft copy, and then I'll ask for it to be placed on the agenda. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, meeting with legislators. Um, the fact that Kat is listed here as the presenter is a holdover, and I didn't catch it when we were looking at last year's agenda. But you did take that on last year, right, to contact and invite? I think, I don't know, did I? I think I might have. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about mainly because they were the new, um, because Braintree was under a new right. area right. Now, That's what, now yeah. because yeah. they were broken out from Orange County. So we just wanted to make sure that, that we made sure to invite all of our legislators. Yeah. Um, when, that's typically what, the February meeting? That February. Um, and we typically just send an email inviting them to attend that meeting and yes. do a five minute 10 minute thing from each of them. Um, we welcome them to be in person or they can meet online. I think most of ours from Montpelier area, we had one in person um, and the other two were online. And then we had our legislators from this area where, who were all in person as well. So it, was, it wasn't hard. Is there someone who um, could volunteer to take that on? Sure. Great, Sam, thank you. Um, and it is, uh, I don't have the February date in front of me. Uh, do I, does it have to be a matter of public record? Or it's, just... the, it's Valentine's Day. It's the 14th. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Thank you. Hey. Jay doesn't have a date. <laughs> <laughs> um, does uh, it have to be a matter of public record, or can I call or text? I'm, I'll move that you contact legislators to invite them to our February meeting. Beautiful. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll do that. Rachel seconds. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Sarah. Opposed? Extensions unanimously passes. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let's see, minutes. Anyone have edits? Concerns? Well, just a question here. Approve Raven budget. Didn't we just do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not on here. Mm -hmm. 
And there's only so it's this the, and the one faculty hire that I saw in here. Just the one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Special education. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you be by you, Hannah. Oh. Okay. Uh, so move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. And seconds. Further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Sarah? Uh, opposed? Abstentions. The motion passes unanimously. Superintendent's report. What's this question? The finance one is um, finances are in good shape. We're, we should have spent 41% of our overall budget at this point in time in the year. We've spent 36. So we're well over last grade. Anyone have any questions for Lane? Good. Uh, financial report. Questions there? Well, you did just help give us a, <laughs> just where we're at. Uh, action items. Okay, so I am going to contact the VSBA, um, quickly find out if they're available, and uh, open a request for proposal. Please email edits suggestions. Um, uh, um, no, sorry, use the suggestions and track changes tool in Google Docs. Um, and uh, Chelsea and Anne will um, use their judgment in judging those into the letter, and we will look at that letter next month, next year. Um, and I'll contact legislators. You'll contact legislators. Katya will contact Pietro, and I think that is it. Um, we do need move to session. enter executive ses session at 8:43 for tuition waiver request and the 4,500 investigation. Um, inviting Lane Millington, Heather Lawler, and Kay Link into that meeting. Um, Danielle Whitney. And who? I'm sorry, your name? Oh, no, you're right. No. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. My name is Danielle Whitney. Oh, okay. this is the waiver request. Oh, okay. This is the waiver request. And Danielle is coming to executive session as well for the waiver request? Uh, if she no. goes first, yeah. Okay. So you can come into executive session for the waiver request, and we'll do that first. And then we have to come out, and then we go back in again. We put out a second decision. Oh, okay. Executive so we'll session. do that one first. That was very confusing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone understand that. Function. You did it really well. Do I have a second? So we'll go in first, and then we'll come out, and then we'll go back in. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you want all of that now? Well, we're just we're going into executive session, executive session to point deal point with the uh, uh, or the tuition waiver first. Tuition yes. waiver, and then we'll come out, and then we'll go into the second one. So we're going to be moving into executive. So.